Welcome everyone to the third installment in our webinar series on the European Health Union and thank you for joining us. My name is Dimitra Pantelli and I work with the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. Together with the European Health Forum Gastein, we are organizing this uh, webinar series under the European Health Union Initiative. So the initiative aims uh, at advancing uh, the European Health Union beyond crisis preparedness and adding value for societies and for citizens. Earlier this year, uh, we looked at the issues of joint purchasing in our first webinar in the series and the collaboration on equipping the workforce with the digital skills for the, for the health system of the future in the second webinar. Today, we are focusing on the European reference networks. European reference networks were introduced by the 2018 Patients' Rights Directive on cross-border care uh, to optimize care for patients with complex or rare diseases and conditions that require highly specialized treatment. Uh, by facilitating discussion among providers uh, in different European countries um, and bundling, of course, knowledge and, and resources. They are virtual networks, um, so the, to review a patient diagnosis, ERN uh, coordinators uh, convene virtual meetings, advisory panels from specialists across different countries and disciplines um, in using dedicated IT tools. Um, the first ERNs were launched in 2017, and we have, in the meantime, over 20 ERNs working in a range of, of areas. Um, and uh, we also have first evaluations of the ERNs uh, where we see uh, successes, but also challenges. It's very clear under the, the European Health Union uh, concept and the European Health Union initiatives that ERNs this, this opportunity to bring together providers from different set settings, the highly specialized experts on the individual patient is really a very, very useful tool. Um, so what we aim to do with today's webinar is to hear about the experience of the first years of operation and the evaluation um, and think about how we can build on that experience to uh, make the role of the ERNs even stronger uh, towards a stronger European Health Union. Uh, we have, we will hear uh, most recently, we have the evaluation of the cross-border healthcare directive that was published just a couple of weeks ago uh, by the European Commission. So we will hear about that and we will talk with uh, colleagues from different perspectives exactly about how to bring uh, the ERNs forward. Uh, before turning to our panel and starting the, the discussion, a couple of housekeeping rules from our side. As always, we want to hear from you. Some of you already sent us questions and comments in advance, so we're very helpful, uh, grateful for that. But you still have the opportunity to interact with us now. So there is a chat box, so please use it for questions and comments. And my colleague, Erica Richardson, as always, um, is there to keep an eye on what you, uh, what you write and feedback to the panel during the discussion. Thank you, Erica. Um, and at some point during the webinar, after we've, we've heard from our panelists, their first uh, insights will come to your, to your inputs and feedback and discuss further. So without further ado, I would like to present our very, very uh, distinguished panel today. We have Martin Dorazil, who is Deputy Head of Uni at the, for European Reference Networks in Digital Health at the European Commission, at the Director General for Health. Uh, we have Magda Klebos, who is the Executive Director for Science Policy and Regulatory Affairs at FPA. We have Jan Lecam, Chief Executive Officer at Eurordis. Ruben Diaz, who is the Secretary General of the European Children's Hospital Organization and in a number of, of ERNs as well. Biruta Tumiena, uh, Head of the Division of Clinical Genetics and Genomics at the University Hospital in Vilnius. And we will hear uh, from all of them from their different perspective and complementary perspective uh, about how we can work uh, in this area. First, we go to Martin uh, for his uh, presentation, uh, reflecting to us the first years of experience with the ERNs. Uh, Martin, I remind you, we have about 10 minutes and I will be strict because we have so many interesting uh, perspectives to hear today. So if you see me appear at some point, it means you, know, you should wrap up, uh, but we're really looking forward to your, to your input. So I pass the floor on to you directly. Please tell us what the evaluation of the cross-border directive found on ERNs. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dimi, and uh, good uh, afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you um, for uh, giving me the opportunity today uh, to uh, present a little bit the, the, uh, the results of the, of the evaluation of the Cross-Border Healthcare Directive and in particular uh, focus on, on the conclusions regarding the European uh, reference networks. As you very well uh, explained, uh, uh, Dimi, um, uh, already, 
uh, we are at the point, uh, you know, five years uh, after the, the establishment of the European Air Defence Network. So uh, it's, a, it's a rather special, uh, special moment because uh, the European Air Defence Networks are still in the development stage. Uh, they are still uh, uh, developing and, and, and evolving themselves. At the same time, five years is already uh, a sufficient time uh, to do a first uh, evaluation and look at what is working well and where uh, there is a scope for, for improvement. And this is what uh, exactly we have done um, through, the, uh, through the evaluation. So I will uh, ask for a next slide and I will start uh, very briefly with a general uh, um, introduction on what the European reference uh, networks are what is, is their objective, what, what, what is their aim. So this, is, uh, uh, this, this picture is, is, is taken from uh, the Commission's website and it shows a virtual map uh, with all the existing ERN uh, uh, members um, that are connected uh, uh, to the system. Since 2017, the system uh, grew quite significantly. So uh, uh, as of today, or as of 1st of January, actually this year after the, the, the most recent enlargement, uh, of the ERNs, we have uh, almost uh, 1,500 uh, members of the of the uh, ERNs being part of of the system, and uh, I'm glad to say that uh, uh, we now cover uh, all the EU uh, member states plus uh, plus Norway. Next slide, please. Uh, currently, we have 24 uh, European uh, reference networks in place uh, in the area of of rare or low prevalence complex diseases. Uh, each of the 24 networks is, is, is covering a uh, different uh, rare uh, condition or, or rare disease. So, so here is, is, is the list of, of the existing uh, 24, uh, 24 networks. Next slide, please. And um, to explain a little bit, and then and, and Dimia, I mean, uh, you, you already mentioned it yourself. What are actually the, the ERNs? What are they, they doing? Uh, what uh, benefits can they bring to uh, the European patients and uh, uh, to the healthcare providers and health systems in, in, in general? So uh, the underlying uh, idea behind the ERNs is, is, is that, uh, especially in the area of rare diseases, it is very important to, to bring together and pool the knowledge uh, and expertise that is there is very scarce and scattered um, across the EU. So uh, the ERNs are uh, bringing together um, uh, the um, the most uh, qualified and and and, and uh, skilled experts in, in in the field. They bring them together through the virtual uh, remote consultations and 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 clinical uh, discussions through a telemedicine IT uh, tool on uh, individual patient cases. So they are directly involved in. Uh, in helping uh, to provide the right diagnosis and, and the right treatment to the, the patients with, uh, with the rare uh, conditions. But that's uh, certainly not the only area of, of, of activities uh, of, of the ERNs. Uh, the ERNs are also um, very active in generating knowledge on, on, on rare diseases. Uh, so for example, uh, in producing uh, clinical uh, guidelines and other clinical uh, decision uh, making tools. Uh, they are also involved in, in various research uh, projects and research collaboration in the area of rare diseases. And they also um, contribute to uh, education and, and, and professional training, for example, for, uh, through developing training programs and e-learning programs and, uh, and other activities. Next slide, please. So now I'm, I'm moving a little bit uh, to the exercise of, of the evaluation of, of the cross-border uh, healthcare uh, directive. Uh, the directive was adopted in 2011. Uh, it covers uh, different uh, areas of, of, of cross-border uh, health activities. So uh, an important, of, of, of the, uh, important part of the directive is looking at the issues of cross-border healthcare, access to cross-border healthcare and, and reimbursement of, of healthcare that is provided in, in another member state. But there is also an important part of the directive that is looking at the issues uh, related to the cooperation between the member states in the era, uh, era of health and care. Uh, for example, in the era of, of, of health, uh, sorry, e-health, uh, in the era of, of cross-border regional cooperation. Uh, initially, also uh, the era of health technology assessment was, was covered by the provisions of the directive. And an important um, 
provision of, of the directive concerns the European reference networks. It's, it's the Article 12 of, uh, of, of the directive, which provides the legal basis on which the ERNs uh, are actually established. So 10 years after uh, the adoption of, of, of the directive, uh, the Commission uh, decided to uh, carry out uh, an evaluation of the policy and of, of the legal framework that is that is in place following the, the principles of the better uh, regulation that are being generally applied by uh, the Commission. This evaluation of the cross-border healthcare directive was, was um, analyzed, uh, analyzing and looking at different aspects. So uh, among other things, it was, it was looking how the directive's objectives to facilitate access to safe and high quality cross-border healthcare in another member state has been met. To, to what extent is the directive relevant for meeting uh, patient needs in cross-border healthcare and so on? But one important element that uh, the directive also looked at uh, was how the treatment and diagnosis of patients with rare and complex diseases have benefited uh, so far from the support of, of the ERNs. And that's uh, the main focus of my inter intervention today. Next slide, please. Uh, so as part of this, this, this general evaluation um, question, uh, uh, some more, more uh, nuance or detailed evaluation questions uh, have, been, uh, have been developed. Uh, so some of them are on this slide. So the evaluation uh, looked at how effective is the directive in supporting the diagnosis and treatment of, of patients with rare and complex diseases through the ERNs. How effective is the uh, directive also in um, facilitating knowledge sharing, so going beyond uh, the clinical uh, collaboration and, and, and supporting uh, uh, knowledge sharing among the uh, health care professionals. What has been the impact of the directive on the research uh, in the area of rare and low prevalence complex diseases? Uh, are the ERNs uh, set out in the directive still relevant uh, today for, for meeting the needs of, of patients with rare and complex diseases? And uh, in what ways the ERNs established uh, by the directive provide added value uh, to patients uh, in comparison to the national solutions model? Next slide, please. So uh, the, the evaluation of the cross-border healthcare directive started in January uh, last year uh, by publishing a roadmap, uh, which is the, the usual uh, procedure. And um, uh, the commission with uh, support of an external uh, contractor uh, carried out a evaluation study, uh, which applied a mixed uh, methods approach uh, to answer the study questions. And this mixed uh, methods approach included an extensive review of relevant literature and documents, but also uh, analysis of, of the website of, of the national contact points for uh, cross-border healthcare. A uh, very important point, uh, we organized an open public consultation uh, last year, over the summer uh, last year, uh, through which we received uh, almost 200 responses from a wide range of, of, of stakeholders. And uh, also we conducted a, a targeted stakeholder a consultation activities, including interviews and questionnaires. And in total through this targeted exercise, we engaged with uh, 285 stakeholders at uh, both EU and, and national level. This included um, very close contacts uh, with the ERN community, including the coordinators of the existing uh, uh, European Defense Networks, uh, uh, also members of the ERN board of the member states, so the representatives of the national authorities uh, dealing with uh, ERNs at the national level and with patient representatives. Uh, and on, on the basis of all this work, a final uh, evaluation report was published uh, a little bit more than one month ago in the beginning of, of May this year. Next slide, please. Uh, so what were the main, main findings of, 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 of the evaluation? Uh, in general terms, the directive concluded that uh, uh, the evaluation concluded that the directive um, had a substantial impact in the area of rare diseases, and and that was a positive impact uh, to support the diagnosis and treatment of rare patients, and also that the creation of the ERNs mobilized substantial commitment from uh, health professionals and investment by healthcare providers in the area of rare diseases. Uh, it confirmed that the ERNs uh, facilitate knowledge generation and sharing that the uh, ERN's uh, involvement in research on rare diseases is critical to find solutions for patients encountering uh, one of those conditions. And um, it also uh, you know, confirmed uh, in, in terms of some, some specific figures that uh, currently we have uh, almost 1,500 ERN members being part of the system. 
And in addition to that, uh, more than 200 uh, affiliated partners uh, uh, from, uh, for example, member states uh, that are not able uh, for the moment to um, have a center on, on their territory that would fulfill all the criteria uh, to become a full-fledged uh, ERM member. And uh, currently the system covers all the EU member states and Norway. Uh, the ERN uh, members uh, in total uh, treated uh, 1.7 uh, million patients uh, already. Uh, the patients participated to 732 clinical trials within the ERNs. And also uh, patient representatives are uh, very well integrated uh, into the collaboration uh, process through the ERNs. So these were uh, the, 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 the findings of the directive uh, in terms of what is working well and where the, the ERNs are really bringing added value. Next slide, please. But of course, uh, the evaluation also look at uh, the things that could be improved uh, in, in the future and uh, identified some, some existing challenges or, or, or issues that, that should be further addressed. So um, again, with the caveat uh, that we need to bear in mind that the ERNs are in place only for five years uh, and, and they are still you know, in this evolving uh, stage. Um, there are uh, important issues to be addressed in, in the months and years to come. And these include, um, uh, issues related to complex and sometimes non-interrable uh, IT uh, facilities that are available to, uh, to the ERNs, for example, for their uh, virtual consultation. Uh, one issue that was, that was raised through the evaluation is the existing complexity of, of the ERN funding and, and, and need to streamline uh, the existing system. Uh, uh, there is an absence of a mechanism for reimbursement for cross-border uh, virtual uh, ERN expert panels, and that's also something we, we should be focusing more uh, in the future. And um, the last point on this slide, but I, I, I think it's, it's, it's probably the most important one, is uh, the insufficient integration of the ERNs in the, in the national health uh, systems and the absence of clear patient pathways on how to access the expertise that is available at the, uh, within the ERNs. Next slide, please. And uh, I have just two uh, last slides, so uh, I will finish quickly. Uh, uh, so based on, on, on these findings of, of, of the evaluation, what is, is the, uh, what is the way forward? What, what would be the next steps? In general terms, uh, the evaluation concludes that safeguarding the sustainable development of ERNs requires action by member states, supported by the Commission to better integrate in uh, the ERNs into the national healthcare systems. And also solutions should be find, uh, found to ensure the smooth functioning of ERN virtual consultation panels so that more rare disease patients can receive the long-awaited answers about their diagnosis and treatment. In terms of, of, of practical operational next steps, uh, the final evaluation report uh, also includes an annex uh, with some kind of a roadmap or action, action plan. And, and some of these, uh, these steps that are proposed are listed on, 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 on this and the next slide. So, uh, First um, issue to improve the integration of ERNs into the national health uh, care systems. To address this, for example, we will be launching uh, uh, later this year a joint action, uh, and we would like to engage the member states in this joint action to, to, to work on, on, on the solutions to address this issue. Next slide, please. And that's the last slide. Uh, with regard to the improvement uh, of the IT infrastructure, uh, including the ERN virtual expert panels, uh, we uh, need to develop, and we are currently, I mean, in the process of developing a new version of the existing CPMS um, system, and we would like to make it available to the ERNs as, as soon as possible. With regard to the uh, potential mechanisms for reimbursement of healthcare providers that are involved in the virtual expert panels, uh, uh, we are supporting and we, uh, we intend to further support the pilot schemes uh, to explore various ways uh, how this reimbursement could be arranged. And uh, also, uh, uh, we should work towards simplification of the administrative burden related uh, to the funding. So streamlining the funding, bringing all the different funding sources to, to, together and, and, and make this uh, system uh, easier to manage uh, for, for the ERNs. So um, I will, I will uh, conclude here, uh, and we hope that with all these, these points addressed, we will uh, e you know, provide even better possibility for, uh, for the patients uh, in, in, in Europe to use uh, the benefits that the ERNs uh, are offering uh, to the most. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Martin. This was both both comprehensive uh, and I think also very clear, uh, particularly on the on the ways forward. We come to the ways forward a little bit later. I think what we want to do now uh, is to ask uh, our panelists to join us on screen, or rather our our host to 
let our panelists join on screen. Um, because we would like to hear uh, how um, the what Martin presented as the experience of the first four five years of operation of the of the of the ERNs actually if that reflects your experience from your individual perspectives um, and how that how that chimes with what you've seen and I I think we start with Jan uh, from the from the patient perspective Jan you you come from from Eurordis let us know your thoughts. What has been your your experience the first years thank, of operation? Thank you, yes. Dimitra, and, and thank you, Martin, uh, for that. We should always keep in mind that the title of the directive is Patients' Rights to Cross-Border Healthcare. And reading the European Commission report, uh, uh, really, we have the diamond of the ERNs, which clearly is, is a big progress in only five years, as Martin said, but which still needs to be uh, polished and further, but all the rest is very disappointing. And I'd like to insist on that because when you read the report on page 16, it starts by saying that it's it's a success. But when you go from page 16 to 22, you see all the challenges in terms of access to healthcare uh, across borders. And when you get to page 22, you see the disaster that it is for people with rare diseases. It is described in the report itself. So ERNs are a great progress, but what is, is absolutely not in place is the cross-border healthcare. Everything cannot be limited to the virtual consultation. People also need face-to-face -face meeting to cross borders. And for that today, they have a huge burden of uh, prepayment. Uh, and you, we've seen from the figures that only 10% are using the current directive process because it's too complex. So they're using the social security regulations. And the reality today of the patients is that they are not informed about how it works. The report says they are informed, they are not informed. So I'd like to see the evidence that says that the patients are informed. What they are telling us is that they are not informed. The national contact points are not working. They are not connected to the national helplines, which when they exist, they are not connected to national readiness alliance. They are not or poorly connected to the centers of expertise of the of the of the ERNs. And the 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 financial burden is high. We have stories of people who have to sell their house, to have advanced money, who have major difficulties to, to recover. So a key element for us will be that without changing the directive, but changing the implemented act, that the opinion of the ERNs become binding. They become, when a patient is pursuing a cross-border care, that what the doctor in the, in the center of the cross-border care is uh, it becomes then binding to have access to another to a treatment or to a diagnostic to another country. That would really reinforce the system. And yeah. all vision is too much, just to finish on that, too much vision on the national aspect. The national aspect is important. We need to build the pathway. We're absolutely on that and pushing that. But also to keep in mind that the ERNs is also European system. It's cross-border. So we need to work in a matrix way in these two dimensions. Thank you very much, Anne. I think it was quite useful to put the issue of the ERNs against the backdrop of the overall evaluation of the directive. When we come back to you in the second round on the on the ERNs specifically, the way that they have operated until now, maybe we 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 weigh in on that a little bit. Birute, I come to you uh, and and ask you to give us your your experience. You've been quite involved in in the whole ERN process. So specifically on the ERNs, how do you see the the evaluation findings? Yeah, thank you very much. Being actually from a country like Lithuania, that is a small country and actually newcomer in the EU, uh, so-called newcomer, I would like to, to give some thoughts about potential of ERNs to tackle inequities across uh, member states in, in tackling rare diseases. In rare diseases, of course, we have champions and less experiences everywhere and we may expect that those champions are from those older EU members and those uh, less experienced from uh, EU 13 countries. And indeed, the first wave of EN um, call for true members actually was uh, for, for those uh, who attain to their highest standards. And the second was for affiliated uh, partners. And it was a, a brilliant way to include less experienced uh, centers into the e e ENs and establish really 
the link for every uh, patient who is in need for EMs across EU. Uh, so what, what are the results of uh, this process? It has two waves of calls for true members and one of affiliated. 64% of affiliated partners come from EU 13 countries and 86% are from true members. Of course, we have some champions uh, and less developed also across uh, newcomers and, and uh, older member states, but it is really a brilliant way to uh, tackle inequities, and I really believe that it will be, but this process depends not only on the wish of centers to, to end ENs, but also on authorities who designate affiliated partners. And therefore, we still have some whitish spots uh, on the European map. It is, we still have some countries with undeveloped links, even through affiliated partners to ENs. And that means that for these countries, ENs may not only diminish inequities, but actually uh, inadvertently, it may increase inequities and national authorities have to take that into account. Thank you, Mira. This is a really important point. When we come back to you, maybe also we will reflect on inequities of representation within countries, especially for, for certain areas. We come back to that topic. Ruben, we come to you. You also have a number of ERNs. Um, you're linked to, you're connected with them. What has been your experience in particularly in the area of, of child health care? Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dimitri, for the opportunity. I, I, I do represent, you know, a number of children's hospitals across Europe. Uh, there are reference hospitals. And I think, let me, in, my, in this first round, bring, bring to, to your attention the benefits of the concept of the ERNs that have had in the hospitals we participate, that I, at least I represent. In average, our hospitals have 17 ERNs in, within their system. So they've heavily invested in this process. And I think that has helped really galvanize uh, some areas of the healthcare community, especially the pediatric community, since, as you know, 80% of, uh, of rare disease patients are diagnosed in, in the pediatric age. Now, it has actually helped us galvanize and understand and focus on, this, uh, on the rare disease patients. Um, to be honest with you, I don't think uh, any hospital right now even has the census of how many rare disease patients are treating. So th this is a great motivator for the children's hospitals to start, or hospitals in general, to start paying attention uh, to these patients and focus a little bit their attention to their needs. So I think this is one benefit that uh, this initiative has really provided for hospitals. It is also true that, uh, as, as, as it has been mentioned before, that primarily the effort has been to at least try to provide these consultations, telematic consultations. And I think the expectation initially to sort of uh, foster the cross-border care when it was necessary has been difficult to implement. And I think this is a discussion that we certainly can have uh, a little bit more. And the other benefit, I think, and I, you know, I want to sort of provide a positive bend on it, is that I've been very pleasantly surprised as to how hospitals have also opened to patient participation in some of the decision making around how to structure care for rare disease. This has been, in my opinion, uh, one of the positive effects of this, of this process. And I, I know that patient involvement is, has been at all levels here, at, you know, at the commission level, at the ERN level, but I think hospitals have also become more aware of the need to have patients participate in this process. So, this round, let me let me end here to, to give everybody a chance, but I think then we can discuss some of the issues associated with uh, hospital management of this care. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We come, as, as you say, Ruben, we come to the tangible, what have we learned from that in a second. Mata, uh, I come to you from the, from the industry uh, perspective, from the pharmaceutical industry perspective. It's a very important area for you, uh, rare diseases. What has the, uh, has the experience been on your side? Yes, indeed. Thank, thank you so much for, for having me today. And I'd like to, to really start from uh, where uh, Jan started, that the cross-border directive, it's about health, delivering healthcare to the patients in the first place. We should remember, though, that uh, research today is so intertwined with uh, healthcare, especially in the rare disease space, where this is the best chance for patients to receive um, a treatment or an access to, uh, to, to new technologies, to new solutions, that we also need to look at ERNs from that point of view 
of intertwining healthcare and research and helping developing new medicines for the patients in the future. And from that point of view, ERNs had been a fantastic success. Their setup is such a great opportunity for both healthcare and the research community. So let me make just three points related to public-private um, collaboration, because I think that public and private research should have the same access to ERNs and ability or possibility to collaborate with them. So first is, um, um, it, well, it works, uh, where the engagement can be there, it really works well. And it is a real win-win for all parties. ERNs have knowledge, they have a, a fantastic body of knowledge, they have fantastic ability to connect the dots and to work with patients, uh, with clinicians, with everyone. So that's, that's a fantastic achievement. Now, um, again, on what worked absolutely fine uh, from the point of view of interactions between the public and private sectors is um, uh, consolidation of standards, is it's looking at the standards of care, it's, uh, it's doing all of that that really helps progressing research. And one of the companies uh, uh, working with Yaren said, uh, actually, the body of knowledge that is there and the expertise is invaluable um, for medicines development. It is comparable with the advisory boards that companies have. So the knowledge is absolutely invaluable for research as well. Now, there were elements where it didn't work. So I asked what didn't work, why uh, engaging collaboration was difficult. And there were uh, three examples where one, it's with the statement about collaboration states that the, there is a willingness to collaborate, but it's written in a way that may be perceived sometimes as being restrictive and not really encouraging, but really warning against collaboration or raising a, a lot of red flags. Second is that there are tiffing problems. People don't always know where to go, whom to find, who is the contact person, how to get there. Um, and and that's, that's, the, that's the other point. We should remember that ERNs are not homogeneous. They are all different for a good reason. And there is not a single and simple way of engaging. There are no simple rules of engagement. So that engagement seems sometimes a bit difficult. And when it doesn't happen or wasn't successful, it was also because there was a perception of conflicts of interest and a bit of an inertia on both sides on how to create that collaboration. Collaboration. But again, and to summarize, when it works, it's fantastic. ERNs are definitely a great achievement of this directive and of, of the community, and uh, uh, it has a chance to deliver both to healthcare and to research. Thank you very much, Magda, also for highlighting, you know, this is in a way the, the first, as you say, the teething period of the first of the first five years to try to, to establish everything. Before we go to the audience, let's take a, a quick round because we heard a lot of it. Magda, I think you maybe already covered this, but I'll come back to you anyway. But the really tangible lessons, and Ruben also mentioned it, Biruta, also Jan, uh, in, the, in the what do we take away? Martin, I will start with you. You had on your, on your final uh, slides the areas of focus for the future. And for me, those are the tangible lessons in a way. But maybe if you would summarize, like what are we taking with us for the really... Uh, next steps from the first years of experience, also having heard everyone uh, in the panel. Just briefly before we, before we go to the audience. Thank yeah. you. Over. Thank you, Dimi. I, I mean, very briefly, uh, no, it was, it, was, it was very interesting, I mean, to, to hear the comments, because I think, uh, even though they may be phrased a little bit uh, differently, I mean, I mean they, they match to a large extent uh, the, the findings of, 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 the, of the evaluation. And I think, uh, uh, the, it, you know, the, one of the, the most important areas for further work that was identified is, is, is better integration of, of the ERNs with what is happening at the national, uh, local and regional level. So we need to avoid, I mean, these uh, ERNs, which are doing uh, an excellent job, you know, at, at the European level and exchanging the, the expertise at the European level, we now need to make sure that this is translated and brought to the patients at the local and 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 and, and uh, regional level. And and in many member states, this is currently not happening or or uh, happening very very slowly. Uh, with that, I'm 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 confident that this will also improve, for example, the awareness in in the rare disease community and, and among the patients about the, the possibilities they 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 have. What is the right pathway uh, to 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 reach the expertise that 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 is there? So uh, and and. Uh, there were, you know, I, I would make a distinction between the the, um, the findings and the comments also made today that are re related to the ERNs in the strict sense, and and uh, and and these we will try to certainly to address. 
there were other you know comments uh, uh bringing up a little bit you know wider issues related for example to the, to the reimbursement of the cross-border healthcare and the difficulties i mean uh, in, in accessing uh the cross-border healthcare due to the financial cons constraints i think this is for for a separate this is a very important issue i i agree and we we need to, to have that discussion but i think i think this is this would deserve a separate panel or separate discussion because the other issues are very uh, much more complex uh to be discussed uh here today thank you thank you and i think martin the experience has been so far is exchanging knowledge across borders rather than exchanging patients across borders at least when it comes to the to the erns and this is a, as you say a very important uh, discussion to have also on the exchanging patients part the reimbursement part we're also thinking about that on digital in general uh, remote consultations, particularly after the pandemic. So it all fits together, I think, for another series of webinars, we can talk about that. Ruben, I come to you because you mentioned uh, already in your previous intervention, this idea of the tangible, um, let's say, consequences of ERNs for the management perspective of hospitals. And I think having heard also everyone else, we have a very clear case here also for the integration at that level. Also, I think in previous discussions we've had, it was clear that, for example, those who are involved in part may be doing so in their like volunteering their time basically because there is no clear financing scheme so i'm pretty sure from a managerial perspective this is not a very straightforward thing so how do you uh, how do you see like the tangible lessons from the teething period from the management perspective well i think you know if you if you think about this you know the erns are central you know even if you look at the membership the membership is based on hospital participation you know, there are hospitals that participate in the network, you know, so, you know, and, and in fact, all the clinical data that's relevant, you know, at least at some level or another for these patients resides in the hospital. So we, we're managing this data. And I think it's imperative that uh, the hospitals have a way to interact with this, you know, with a model, with this platform in a way that's smooth and clear. Uh, but then also the physicians, the, the specialists, the, clini the clinical care uh, specialists that work uh, in the ERNs also work within the hospitals. And you are also brought up some issues of time concerns, reimbursement concerns. I think that th from that observation, I think that we have, uh, I, would, I would ask that we focus more on how the hospital manages rare disease care, because that would also impact on how uh, this care is extended to these in, in integrate this care to the regional or national networks because uh, there are hospitals that are integrating into the national networks. So I would I would ask at this at this stage that we pay attention as to how hospitals can help manage and promote this model, you know, sort of thing. Because that would also require for the hospitals to rearrange a little bit the models of care for rare disease, open up to this interaction and collaboration. That's part of the reason, for example, ECHO exists, because we have come to realize that we need to be very collaborative, especially when it comes down to data sharing uh, and uh, model guideline sharing and, and, and outcome sharing, you know, sort of thing. I mean, issues like, and I'll stop here, issues like transition to adult care for, for patients these things become relevant and it's only in the hospital setting that we can resolve these issues and have to share them with the ERN networks. And Ruben, what would be the best vehicle, you think, to focus on this or to work on this? Uh, also, well, I, I'm assuming not only at the national level, but also at the collaborative best practice exchange level, right? I think, you know, I think the Commission is also entertaining ways to sort of approach, but I think the, the to have hospital participation in some of the decision making, you know, the manager in the decision making of how to structure these initiatives may not be a bad idea, something for the Commission to certainly consider uh, to have a more active participation because, uh, you know, one issue, one easy problem that the ERN providers will do is, you know, how many times we have to introduce, you know, information into different platforms. How can we smooth this out? You know, these are simple questions and we can make a long list about this, but these are the sort of thing. I mean, active participation of the hospital management at some level or another, especially those that are very invested in this process, can help smooth out some of these interactions, including the integration of the ERN networks into national networks, because after all, our hospitals are participating in the national networks too. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, thank you very much. Uh, really important. I, I wonder, but this is a question for, for a whole different webinar, how the European health data space fits with all the interoperability questions and information questions. We, we, we talk about that maybe at the end, if we have time. Um, Magda, I think you were next uh, in the sense that you brought us um, 
the potential in your first intervention, perhaps a little bit more tangibly, what are the next step public-private partnerships? You said, how do we address some of the issues that you raised in the first, in the first intervention? Okay, so I would like also to come back to the European health data space um, yeah. uh, after that, because I think that's part of the uh, ability to collaborate uh, and, and, and data and data flows and access to data and who can do what. So I would say I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But on, on the collaboration, I think, as I said, the, um, the, the ERNs are very are not homogeneous. They are very heterogeneous. They are different in the way they are structured, etc. So I think um, I'm, I'm not suggesting harmonization because that's a big mantra of, of some of the European programs. And that's not necessarily the good, uh, the good way of doing. But I think that if we had a, a positive, constructive framework of engagement between public and private sectors in with ERNs, that it's more structured. Not that this collaboration doesn't exist, but couldn't we learn from good practice of where these collaborations really work and establish these as principles for engagement uh, across ERN so that this collaboration can be facilitated. Sometimes uh, also companies have suggested that when collaboration has to go with one ERN, that's fine. But when the disease is complex and needs to go across two ERNs, that becomes even more complicated. So uh, a clear rule of engagement and positive based on what we want to achieve together, based on outcomes that we want to achieve together would be fantastic to unlock a little bit of those locks and misperceptions. So that's that's one aspect. And this could be very tangible. It is sitting around the table and agreeing on that and making sure that we that we all know and communicate it properly. The second is about resources, because uh, what we see is that people do the work on, on weekends on the top of their day job. And I think that we've said about reimbursement of, of care to patients, but we also need to resource these ERNs to be able to do that coordination work and this collaboration work. It cannot be a weekend and a hobby horse. It needs to be part of the philosophy. And I know that there is big willingness to do that, but the resources are scarce. So I would like to highlight this part of the resources. And the last point is about European health data space and data standardization. So I think um, in the Innovative Medicines Initiative, we had one program which is called EDEN, European, um, um, uh, European Distributed Data Network, where resources are put to standardize data at the place where they are in order to enable interoperability. I think that we could reproduce that model across ERNs and to, to do something similar because without the standardization, and I think this was also in the chat in the questions from the audience, without the standardization, we are not going to get there. If these three things are happening, for me, we would have a big leap forward and enable this collaboration on research as well. Excellent. Thank you. I think this also brings us closer to the final round, which we're not uh, arriving at quite yet. Jan, I come to you for a brief uh, reflection, specifically on the ERN's tangible lessons from the from the private uh, from the patient's perspective. Yes, from our perspective, really, the ERN's are this great instrument of collaboration to improve the quality, to improve the safety, and to reduce inequalities across Europe. But th there is several dimensions to it. We're speaking a lot at the moment of the integration international healthcare system. And this is essential because that's the way to go from 1.7 million patients, which are the one covered by the members of ERNs, to the broader 20 million population. So to diffuse more the knowledge and also to generate new knowledge. So that's important. But we should not lose the dimension of the European level. That is also about cross-border care in different ways. First, to enable the patients to go physically to another country. So we insist on that. So there is a link between this aspect of the directive and the ERNs. Particularly, I go back to the binding expert advice here. The second element is the virtual aspect. The virtual aspect should not be limited to CPMS, should not be limited to panel expert advice. It's also about consultation. And for these different services, we need to have a proper costing and a proper reimbursement system in place by the member states. But that is directly linked also, not only to member state level, but to provide that actual access to expertise across borders. And that's very much true for the smaller countries, but also for the reverse diseases. Because in practice, for the 400 most frequent diseases, 
the biggest member states are able more or less to provide quality standard of care, or they will be able progressively over the next five, 10 years based on the current system. But where we have issues is with the smaller population member states, and it is for the 5% population of people with rare diseases who cannot rely on national healthcare system, have automatically to rely on expertise at the European level. So that's really cross-border, and that has to be embedded in the vision of the ERNs at the same time that we're looking at the other aspects of the directive. Thank you, Jan. Really, really useful. I think also in line with some of the initiatives that the Commission has uh, for the future, Definitely. I think that's also very useful for that. For that. Um, Biruta, we come to you briefly to wrap us up here with the tangible lessons, uh, because then uh, we go to our audience, finally. Yeah, actually, as a chair of a working group on integration, I would like to address a little bit this issue. Uh, of course, as an elephant in the room, it was identified in the Board of Member States already in 2017, and we have established a working group on that. And at first, we had to identify the main areas for intervention afterwards, the objectives and aims, uh, aims in the uh, every area. Also, what was actually very fruitful is to identify best practices in uh, various member states and to share them, because it is a very good uh, way to, to share uh, um, the way how to tackle that. But actually, what I would like to uh, stress, why it is not implemented, because we do not know the principles, how to establish care pathways. They are not established as, for example, for uh, chronic um, non-infectious diseases or other diseases where we have lots of materials for evidence-based policy making. And actually, we do not have such materials in rare disease areas. We do not know the principles. We do not know the principles how to, uh, how to perform quality assurance, how to perform data management. Therefore, there is a, a lot to do, and we are now also aiming for joint action in this, and we um, hope very much that um, so at least some of the work will be done with it, that joint action by establishing the principles and further sharing of, of best practices. But indeed, rare diseases is e exceptional, and sometimes we do not integrate because we do not know how to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that one of the issues, and I'll be very brief, one of the things that ARNs have been doing is also clinical practice guidelines, right? But these are within, I guess, the, the mostly the inpatient sector. And I think what you're what you're talking about yeah. is also a bit a bit broader than that. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we go to you, Erica. Uh, to give us a little bit of a flavor, I think we all we're all been keeping an eye a little bit on the chat box at the same time. We have a lot of interesting things. We also got a lot of interesting questions in advance. So up to you to choose one or two that we might uh, merge with our final round of insights because we are already quite uh, late. Okay, so um, obviously a lot of discussion around the barriers to scaling up ERNs and the challenges around that, particularly around the financing of cross-border care. Um, and integration into national health systems, and also about ensuring the sustainability of ERNs. So if anybody would like to add anything on that, please do go ahead. But one of the sort of really big questions looking to the future that has come up is um, how might ERNs develop to support people with rare diseases living outside the EU? Is there scope for some aspects of these ERNs to even go global? So. Just, I thought that would be a particularly interesting future-looking thing to finish off. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erica. This is really a, a, an ambitious point, uh, I think, even before we have uh, figured out everything for uh, the, the European or the European Union countries. Okay, I think um, maybe we uh, we think about that for, for a while i think for our for our panelists we have five of you we have about five minutes left maybe we go two minutes above uh, time but not much more so i think there is two points one is the long-term vision and this is linked to the sustainability issue that that erica mentioned and probably this issue of not necessarily european countries uh, patients links with that as well uh, what I would say is we've heard from all of you the more tangible uh, lessons and barriers 
from the first years of operation and they are reflected in the things that Martin talked to us about the perspectives that are now forward looking and what the changes have been from the Commission side and what the ongoing projects are in the joint action. So there is quite a lot to be looking forward to and uh, to see how that how that works. I think it's very important that you all pointed out different things. We, uh, come to them in summary at the very end. Uh, now, if we if we start uh, looking forward to the to the time um, from now on, uh, two questions: long term vision uh, for ERNs. Uh, one question: long term vision for ERNs, and how does that uh, maybe also include um, patients beyond the borders of the European Union? Um, maybe, uh, I think, Birute, we, we ended with you last time. We start with you uh, this time uh, because you mentioned this issue of inequities when we were starting in the very beginning, right? So when we're thinking about the, the long-term vision and perhaps also going beyond the, the member states that we now have represented, how do we tackle this? How do we, at the same time, or maybe one after the other, um, think about making sure that we reach everyone within uh, the union, but also go beyond? This is the final statement, by the way. So if you have any core things that you need to mention, now is the time. Yeah, actually, ERN coordinators, they, they are, or and of course, members and every physician who participates, they are wonderful people. <laughs> Just because they, they have chosen rare diseases, it is very, very difficult area. You know, it, it demands much more uh, experience and learning and so on. And actually, they are very creative. And uh, for, for su such countries, they already establish uh, forms like supporting members, for example, who are not necessarily de designated by authorities. But of course, it is uh, just an um, intermediate uh, way to, to link the, the centers to, to the rare diseases. And authorities have to have that in mind, inequity. Um, um, mm, how to say it, inequity issue. Uh, as an additional argument for authorities, I would like to mention that actually uh, poor or not uh, well organized care for rare diseases is actually very much um, uh, wasteful. And uh, OECD have calculated that wasteful uh, spending in healthcare is about 20%. In rare diseases, it is much more. So for health authorities, it is a, a, a message. If we do not organize it properly, you will uh, eventually uh, waste much more. Thank you. And so I, I'm assuming this is also linked to the to the ERNs taking uh, a bit of an, an active role in this in this direction as well as part of the of the future vision. Thank you very much, Jan. We come to you. I think you you already gave us a bit of a future vision in your previous statements. But if we look, if you think of the big picture and think also of sustainability, but also of of perhaps going beyond the EU borders, what are your thoughts? Right. Right. Okay. So the, the vision for us is very clear. It's all about health outcomes, and it's how we improve the time to diagnose and how to improve the survival and the well-being of the 20 million people affected by rare disease in Europe. And for that, the sustainability issue is key. So that's the funding, but funding is EU funding, surely, for as uh, the EU for Health program is doing now. And hopefully that can be sustained and expanded. So to provide the right support to the core functions of the ERNs in terms of coordination, but also to support these heroic uh, clinicians cumulating different uh, functions. But it's also the funding at the national member states working with the hospital managers to provide the right level of support for these centers of care for which the, the doctors need more time with the patients, need more time for the, for the data collection, etc. So there is specific elements here on the sustainability. And the third element of sustainability, which I already mentioned, is that we need to have a right costing of the services for the face-to-face -face consultation, but even more so for the virtual consultation and for the panel expert advice, so that they can be scaled up. Until this is costed and there is a clear reimbursement mechanism between member states, it cannot be scaled up. The next thing is the European health data space provides, it was well mentioned by Magda and Ruben, provides a huge opportunity to improve the, all the data operations. So that's really part of our vision for the future. The next is, 
to look at Europe beyond EU. So yes, we could think global network. And as you may know, we're working on that with the WHO and 250 experts in the world. But the first area was the European Union, the member states should look at is how do we work together with the populations in Europe beyond the EU within WHO uh, Europe. So this will be really will be my, my key elements. And my last one, which is maybe more new, but that we should think much more of is for the very rare diseases. We do have now some hospitals which have several centers of expertise. They are part of several ERNs. They can be part of 12 to 24 ERNs. Here, we're accumulating a huge expertise. They can be children hospital or adult hospitals. And these few centers need to become kind of lighthouse, kind of European comprehensive rare disease centers, which integrate all the disciplines and all the expertise for the rarest diseases. And for that, we need to have in place also these systems of re reimbursement and access across borders and proper information of citizens of their rights so that they can access to these centers. So they will be, it will be a fantastic new step, not only this embryonic healthcare system with ERNs, but also this lighthouse, which will become European provider of care for European citizens. Thank you very much. And I think it's also quite, quite important to be, to be a bit more disruptive in the way we think forward, even though this is it, not, it's a more constructive rather than a disruptive intervention. Ruben, uh, we come to you. Long term uh, vision. You have some experience with patients outside the EU, so perhaps you want to weigh in on that one. Well, very quickly, I know the time is constrained. Uh, yes, we, we are taking steps, you know, to sort of provide a little help with, with beyond the EU Commission with the ERNs in supporting by providing, for example, with the Ukraine situation here, how to so provide support in that setting. I, I pick up on where uh, Jan picked up. I think the issue here is health outcomes at the end of the day. I, I fully agree with that. And I think just to make it sure, I think data standardization, data sharing is a major, major issue here for rare diseases in particular, because they're rare. And I think that's that's when you can also say that you can go beyond the EU when you need to, because that's that's the nature of this, uh, this entity here that we're dealing with. I think increased access, which is part of the mandate that the European Commission, it has to be, uh, you know, has to be re- you know, revisit it as, as I think the Commission is already doing, you know, thinking of remuneration models for specialists and hospitals involved in that, that has to be on the forefront for both member states and the Commission. I think the models of care, hospitals have a responsibility to, 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 to restructure the model of care so that it provides real answers for these patients. And let's not forget about cross-border care, because uh, if those lighthouses that uh, Jan was mentioning do occur, patients have to, and some patients have to be able to get there, you know, and, and get their assistance and be attended. And I think that this all will lead to better research uh, where we can really have multinational trials uh, for these diseases, which is much needed because of the volume of patients needed. So I think if I can summarize this, this would be my, my, my point. Perfect. Thank you very much, Ruben. This was really, really very clear and to the point. Magda, we come to you for a very brief uh, Reflection before going to Martin to close us. Over to you, Magda. Thank you. So what could I say that hasn't been already said? So let me just highlight three things. The first one is um, the ERNs have already a very ambitious vision. And I agree with the vision led down by, uh, by Jan just right now to, to scale it up. But I think that, first of all, the vision is already ambitious and we need to scale up and upgrade and give resources to achieve that vision as a step one. Uh, second is I hope for a future where ERNs are at the heart of public-private collaborations and facilitate a structured engagement and this integration happens. I think this is necessary. We know that today collaboration is not a choice but a must and I think we should take the best out of public and private sectors, get them together and help patients and help outcomes in the end. The third, I cannot highlight more the EHDS, European Health Data Space, data standardization, and working on that together, they are good examples. We can scale up using models and resources from different sources in Europe. Um, so yeah, I think that that's all I would like to say, but I subscribe to everything else that's been said before. 
Thank you very much, Magda, also very to the point. Martin, you have a very long list here of uh, tangible considerations, but also uh, high level aspirations. I think a lot of that uh, from the very pragmatic of finding uh, the remuneration models and the financing models that will work to the expansion and optimization, let's say, of structures is are things that the Commission has just thought about based on the slides, with perhaps some additional ideas, links to European health data space. A final word from you to close as we're already over time uh, about how you see the, the long term vision and the next steps moving forward uh, beyond the very, very tangible ones. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jimmy. Uh, I think and it was really fascinating and interesting. I mean, to hearing all, all, all these all these uh, proposals and ideas, and I think they, they very much go to a large extent in, in the same direction. I think it is it is very important to have an ambitious long term vision and, 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 and a goal. At the same time, it is, uh, in my view, important to go, you know, step by step in a gradual way and, and start from things that we can improve in, in the short term and hopefully, in, in, you know, in the long term, we will reach that ambitious, ambitious goal. We, the ERNs, I mean, we have the best experts uh, in the field that are uh, working together. And I think what we need to do just now, I mean, give them all they need so that they can do what they do best, treat patients, diagnose patients and, 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 and do research in this area. And I think it is important, I mean, to address uh, especially three things. So one was mentioned already, and, and clearly it, it's a funding, it, 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 it's ensure the sustainability of, of the system. So, uh, to, to have a clear uh, and, and, and transparent funding at the, and easy, you know, easily manageable funding at, at the uh, European level. But at the same time, it, it, it's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there needs to be uh, additional support coming from the member states. Uh, the second, uh, uh, element I would I would mention we need to uh, equip them with with the tools you know that they need so that they can do what they, what they uh, know best and 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 by the tools I mean the IT uh, infrastructure but also for example the data in uh, the format that they can use uh, being interpretable and also we need to give them time I mean uh, the resources so this is the point mentioned with regard to the support that is being provided by uh, healthcare providers. Uh, to the networks that they they really I mean uh, have have the resources they need uh, to, to to help the patient, and the last thing I mean um, we need to improve the uh, the access uh, to the expertise that that we have, and and that that needs to be done on several fronts, starting with the awareness raising and, and dissemination of information, clearly defining I mean uh, the the ways how to how to reach to that expertise, and also making sure that uh, that expertise once available is also affordable. So so touching up on the issues related to the, to the reimbursement. Thank you. Very much, Martin. That was also a, a great summary, I think, of the things that we have heard. I think I will, I will end with a quote from the evaluation that Jan already mentioned in the very beginning. It says the ERNs are a diamond and it needs to be further polished um, before it can truly shine. And I think taking the lesson from today, the way to polish perhaps is really the stakeholder involvement as you're already doing, perhaps even ramping up in different ways, be it the patients, Jan told us about it in the, in the chat box, we heard about being the hospital managers, the coordinators, but also the, the industry and the private uh, public collaboration. A, a, a long road ahead, I think, but a very interesting and very viable road. And I think we will meet again in future to see how far we are with polishing the, the diamond. Um, in due course. We thank you all very, very much uh, for being here with us today. Uh, we're very grateful for all the insights and we hope to see you again very soon. This is the last installment of this series, but we will definitely have more series coming up. So thank you again, enjoy the rest of the day and see you all soon. Bye-bye.